everyone. I am greeting you from the other side of the facial hair cycle. Uh, this is episode four of PQ Attic Analysis on the Colat Conjecture, uh, titled uh, Shut Up and Compute. Yes, that is the name of this episode, Shut Up and Compute. And this is a video series that I'm making to accompany my 2022 PhD dissertation. And uh, this is, uh, along with episode three, where we prove the correspondence principle, this is one of, if not the big videos of this series, because it's here that I'm going to introduce you to PQ Attic Analysis, as I see it. <laughs> so, uh, where to start? It's uh, often said that one of Riemann's greatest contributions to, ma to mathematics, other than his actual uh, 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 literal contributions, was his attitude. Uh, one of the things that uh, Riemann gifted us with uh, was uh, a, a, a self-awareness that we c wouldn't often, uh, wouldn't do to just keep proceeding the way mathematicians like uh, Euler did in the 18th century, where we would just proceed blindly, letting any sufficiently reasonable-looking computational trick pass uh, 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 as, as, as rigorous. Riemann instead said, mm, let's look at what we're actually doing. What are the concepts involved? And in many ways, this attitude would uh, lead uh, to the revolutions in mathematics that occurred in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, in particular, uh, ge geometers like to point to Riemann and to a, uh, to a related extent, uh, Galois, as being some of the first mathematical thinkers who, instead of just diving into a particular problem, instead took a step back and asked, well, what kind of algebraic invariants can we assign to these things? And using these as a way of comparing different structures rather than uh, losing our, our, ourselves in the forest of a particular problem. So this uh, 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 paradigm shift was and is a good thing, incredibly good thing. Um, and it's about at the same time, it's also true that there can be such a, so, such a thing as too much of a good thing. Uh, the uh, uh, Emmy Noether, uh, uh, basically invented modern com uh, commutative algebra, homology, ascending chain conditions, just amazing. And when those ideas and those uh, those who followed in our footsteps were uh, taken up and and formalized in the modern axiomatic approach, it revolutionized mathematics, especially in algebra and number theory, and and also topology, and. Uh, so much so that some, uh, especially on the algebraic side, mathematics has really just taken off. Uh, it's in, it's, in, it's easy to uh, get in, into get into the mindset where you think that uh, if anything truly new happens, it has to occur up in the stratosphere of abstraction. Some big new idea, grand new theory that unifies and gets into a deepest, deeper insight than anyone has previously gained. While that can uh, and probably will uh, still happen, there's plenty of stuff to be done with motives and infinity categories and all of those other frightening things. Um, at the same time, it can inculcate in us a knee-jerk tendency to uh, uh, take any new discovery we come across and then try and uh, stick all, all of our all of our uh, uh, our wires and test tubes and uh, electrodes onto it to try and hook it up to the great puzzle of mathematics to figure out how where we can hammer it in place and make it uh, fit in with the rest of the puzzle um, uh, partly because the axiomatic approach has been so deeply successful, that it's natural to look at this thing and ask, well, how does this relate to theories X, Y, and Z, and use that compatibility, uh, that, that modularity, to, as a basis for evaluating the uh, significance of or value of potential work. And also, this is the thing, it can lead to an unhealthy expectation that um, any problem requires either a clever trick to put it or to put it in the right uh, to make things work out or some kind of uh, insightful reframing in order to make it all perfectly clear and that you in, we forget that in practice uh, progress is hard and it's won only by the skin of our teeth. We um, uh, stumble along bit by bit and have to be willing to take what we find and uh, work with it in its uh, in its own right, but to, to, because nothing. Uh, one of the downsides of uh, 
I have a confession. I'm an anti bourbakist uh, I, I do not like the Bourbaki approach. I think it's beautiful if you want to uh, create a reference textbook because you can see all the logical dependencies. But in terms of good pedagogy, it's completely nonsensical. It's just awful because it's not how we think. Human beings, we are we don't naturally start with uh, big ideas, abstractions, and axioms. We are we work through observational learning. It's, this is how science is. It's the hypothetical deductive method. We go out, we uh, make an observation, we experiment, we um, uh, draw we draw conclusions and make hypotheses, which we then test and improve upon. The same thing here. And wanting to fit things into the big abstract perspective can sometimes undermine uh, our ability to proceed forward. In particular, it lets us, it can make it so that we fail to notice some of the more, some of the simpler and some might say stupider details. <clears throat> because if you're doing everything at the level of, of categories and morphisms and varieties and all of these things, getting a, uh, you're uh, stepping among giants and it's quite easy to lose something in the underbrush that uh, might uh, only be noticed if you actually get down and uh, uh, multiply out polynomials, take square roots and do all, and all of that good stuff. So to that end, for this episode, and I cannot emphasize this enough, our motto will be shut up and compute. Shut up and compute, shut up and compute, shut up and compute. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, so, uh, basically, I'm, I'm trying to say is, let's adopt an 18th century style of, of mathematics. Uh, the one exception that we're going to be doing here is that an operation which involves infinitely many steps, or equivalently, working with divergent series, those are always going to be dangerous, and, uh, we, because uh, as, as, uh, uh, as Abel, who said that, uh, uh, that uh, divergent series are the devil's plaything. One can do whatever one wants with them. We're going to keep those aside, and we're going to confine ourselves to finite operations. So finite combinations of finite quantities, as long as we do not multiply or divide by zero, we are going to want to take these computations on their own terms. By, uh, by which I mean we are going to be focused literally on the symbols that we write on the page and the manipulations that we do with them. The fact that these may have some larger context is very nice, but we haven't arrived at that point yet. We need to start, shut up and compute to find the patterns so that we can then begin generalizing from them. Because, uh, uh, indeed, this is how I ended up discovering this and uh, frames and all the stuff that we've seen so far. It's only because I have decided to sit down and do the computations. <clears throat> So, um, indeed, actually, this is a, 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 a funny thing, the way history works, is uh, part of the reason why Riemann and that uh, movement to, to uh, generalize and uh, axiomatize, the reason, part of the reason why it was so successful was because from uh, Newton th uh, through uh, to Gauss, so much work was done to, in, in shutting up and computing and doing uh, observations, making calculations, that we had a sufficiently broad basis of knowledge to draw from and then create our, our uh, uh, complex superstructure of ideas. As a simple example, Newton and, and Leibniz and that whole school, they did everything with power series. They used them as the be-all, end-all workhorse that made everything turn out nice. As we know now, if we restrict ourselves to power series, i.e. analytic functions, while that can get a lot done, it's nowhere near sufficient. You're uh, not going to be able to discover nowhere differentiable functions if you use uh, only analytic functions. You're not going to be able to discover the uh, uh, almost everywhere L2 convergence of Fourier series using only analytic functions. We need, and to do that, you a new... Uh, new formulas had to be found, new patterns, new manipulations, which could then be grounded in their context and properly understood. <clears throat> the only reason we were able to go so far with analytic function theory was because we spent uh, several centuries milking power series for all that they were worth. <laughs> so, um, in this episode, as I'm going to explain in a moment, I am going to be doing something naughty that will likely anger number theorists and simply horrify field theorists. And to them, 
I say, shut up and compute. I promise I will give all of the clarifying details later, eventually. Um, but I cannot and will not give them here for the simple reason that doing so would completely defeat the purpose of the presentation, which I've worked quite hard to assemble, and that is to convince you that PQ attic analysis at its core is simple. You can teach it to undergraduate engineering majors. The complexity that ar emerge, that arise, emerge quite literally when we attempt to complete this subject and get something useful out of it. And one of the, the irony here is that the more you know about number theory and Galois theory, the harder it is for you to understand uh, my work because you're used to thinking at things from this in this grand interconnected network, and in doing so, you become blind to the to what's written on the page because it, it's just it's really I admit what I found is really weird. So of course it's natural to think no, it, it can't possibly work to, uh, this nicely, but it does. And it, one of the things I'm, I've been quite uh, pleased at is uh, as I, I may have mentioned this before, and if I haven't, I apologize for not doing so. But in one of the, uh, when I was working on my third paper uh, to, uh, to submit for publication, I showed a copy of it, copy of it to the editors of the Journal of Piatic uh, Numbers, Ultrametric Analysis and Applications, the, uh, the journal that published my first two papers, and I sent them, uh, sent one of the editors a a rough draft of of my paper number three, which was already over 120 pages long, and uh, the editor, in fact, all of the editors, they came back unanimously and said this should be a book. And ironically, one of the reasons why I uh, have been trying to publish my series of papers that uh, uh, condenses the research I did in my dissertation was because I wanted to attract attention. Ideally, I'm looking for other mathematicians to uh, work with to help uh, flesh out the subject and iron out the details to, in order to give it a, 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 a treatment that would be suitable for a textbook. Because without that extra work, I'm probably going to have to end up writing the same textbook multiple times to explain the concept each time at an increasingly greater level of complexity. Uh, I am uh, I, I do I'm not do not feel comfortable writing out a complete, comprehensive encyclopedic treatment at this stage. Although my dissertation is as close to that as you'll be able to get, simply because there's so much stuff waiting to be done that I would rather uh, get the main ideas across rather than uh, try and uh, uh, present something uh, as incomplete as the larger body of PQ attic analysis that I found. Still, and this is what I want to say, in preparing uh, this, uh, this video series and uh, this episode in particular, I've actually been uh, uh, unintentionally working toward the process of writing the book just by what I've been having to present. I, uh, just the past few days, have been uh, rewriting the script for this episode, episode four, because I discovered I could give a unifying treatment that made it just really, really elegant and quite beautiful. And I will convince you by the end of this that not only is this something that we can easily explore, but it's something that is just screaming at us to be explored. And hopefully you'll stick around to join me. Uh, but uh, that, that's it for now. Let's, let's get on with the show. So let's begin. So in the spirit of shutting up and computing, I'm going to start with the naughty thing that I said I was going to do, which is one of the, been one of the biggest thorns in my side. Uh, uh, but you'll see what I mean. So consider the, also welcome to LYX. This is my pride and joy. It, it's the love child of LaTeX and uh, Microsoft Word. It's free. It's a front end for La LaTeX. And I love it to death. I can type uh, mathematical text in it in real time. It's amazing. I cannot I speak its praises, uh, sing its praises uh, to the end of time. But anyhow, so suppose I show you this, e to the 2 pi i t, and I tell you that t is in q. What does this mean? Just, no, I and mean, this is very important. Mathematics, lo mathematicians love context. They love to say uh, to have things which make sense only when you know the proper context. I hate that because it means that I need to know multiple times more information 
than it would be absolutely necessary in order to read something because I have to keep in mind the different notations, the different um, uh, conventions, different assumptions. As an example, if you go to the Wikipedia page on sh the concept of a sheaf, technically the definition, uh, when I see the definition of the, of the gluing conditions, it talks about an open cover. To me, that definition is wrong because it should say with respect to the subspace topology because the definition of open cover that I was taught is that if you have a set U, an open cover, a set U in a topological space X, an open cover of U is a collection of open sets in X whose union contains U. The standard in algebraic geometry and sheaf theory is that the is that an open cover is a collection of sets of open sets in X whose union equals Q. And that distinction leads to all sorts of uh, uh, complexities that when I when I read a subject, make it at which I read try and read about sheaves, sheaves it makes it well, as what uh, uh, Terry Todd wonderfully said, it makes it a syntax error. Because I see it and it doesn't make sense. For me, I like to be able to read symbol, strings of symbols and make sense of them as they are. And it's one of the reasons I put so much effort into trying to make sure my notation is consistently compatible. So I'll, when I look at this, let me tell you what I see. When I look at e to the 2 pi i t, where t is rational, I see a root of unity. Now, this is a loaded, this is obviously a loaded question, but what, do, what does a root of unity mean? If we wanted to be really pedantic, I would have to say that I that this thing, at least as conventionally defined, is the power series for the exponential function evaluated at 2 pi i t, and then we're treating all of this in the complex numbers. However, I have no problem using this symbol to denote roots of unity in fields other than the complex numbers. I use this notation in a p-adic context. I use this notation when working over finite fields. Actually, my preferred no notation is uh, C uh, uh, D uh, N. This is a an nth root of a primitive nth root of unity. In particular, it's uh, this is a e to the two pi i over n. And so this is my go-to notation, and I have no problem using this. And indeed, is when I did the things that I'm about to show you, and when I first did it, I did not know that writing this in the p-adic context was a no-no. And it's not just a no-no because there's no such thing as pi in a p-adic context. Uh, there's this gets even there's even uh, worse problems here, and the the key term is embeddings. If you know the comp of uh, what, what that means here, uh, I'm gonna get into all the details later. But if you don't if you don't know, it's a good thing that you don't know for the sake of this discussion, because knowing will only make it more confusing. It will distract you from uh, with theory when what you should be doing is looking at the computations. So uh, that being said, let's now move to the PDF. <clears throat> so the naughty thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using those complex exponential expressions to represent roots of unity. And I'm doing this in any context, in any field or any algebraic structure. Well, actually, no, any field, not algebraic structure, I'm not going to get into matrices. Any field which contains roots of unity, I'm going to denote them using the complex exponential. In particular, the way we worked with complex, the complex exponential e to the 2 pi i uh, tz, where this is the 2 adic fractional part, I explained that notation in episode 1. We're going to be doing that of, with general p, and we're going to extend, and we're going to be doing that regardless of the context. It's our universal notation, and there's a very good reason to want to have this notation, which denotes our object regardless of what field we're in. So just to review the way this works, we, viewing the p-adic fractional part, it's a map which accepts a p-adic rational number and outputs a, a fraction, which we're going to view in the unit interval. And remember, a p-adic rational number is a Laurent series in the variable p, where the coefficients are, are integers in the set 0, 1, dot, 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 p minus 1. So just in general, given a, a p-adic rational number y, uh, e to the 2 pi i for fractional part of y, it's going to be 1 if y is a p-adic integer, and it's going to be the uh, singular part of its Laurent series if y is 
not a p-adic integer. That is, the fra fractional part operator kills all non-negative pow integer powers of p, and only the negative integer powers of p survive. So in particular, given any t in zp hat, this is a uh, now this is a, just make the thing appear. This, uh, just recall, uh, I'm on my new keyboard, so the, the, some of the keys strokes might be off. This is Z, one uh, P mod Z. This is the set of rational numbers in the unit interval, one not included, with powers of P in the denominator, and we make it a group using uh, addition modulo one. And so given any t in zp hat and given any z in zp, writing t in simplest form as k over p to the n, we have that the fractional part of the p-adic fractional part of t times z is congruent modulo 1 to k times the image of the value of z modulo p to the n divided by p to the n. And we view this as a rational number in the unit interval. Also, again, notation-wise, this means the integer in zero, uh, the, that the bracket means the integer from between zero and p to the n minus one, which is congruent to z mod p to the n. <clears throat> so with this notation, we then have that e to the two pi i t z fractional part is e to the two pi i numerator of t z mod uh, uh, the uh, denominator of t the, uh, divided by denominator of t. As a result, again, just notation-wise, given any integer r, which is co-prime to p, and given any p-adic rational number x, such that uh, x has a p-adic absolute value strictly greater than 1, meaning that x's denominator is a power of p, we have that the fractional part of x over r is the same thing as, well, what is this? This is the, we, what we do is we take r, we find its this, uh, the p-adic absolute value of x is going to be p to the n for some n. So we're going to then find the value of r mod p to the n, and then there's going to be a unique integer between 0 and p to the n minus 1, which is a multiplicative inverse of r mod uh, p to the n. And so this is the multiplicative inverse of r mod p to the n, where uh, p to the n is the, op is the uh, denominator slash p-adic absolute value of x. We also have that the, this fractional part is a bilinear form, modulo 1. And so as an example computation, 1 over 48, 2 adic fractional part. We can factor this as 1 third times 1 16th. 1 16th. So this is going to be the multiplicative inverse of 3 mod 16. And the multiplicative inverse of 3 mod 16 is 11. So this is 11 over 16. And so that's the answer. And like more generally, here, suppose we have p is any prime and 2 over 15. Well, this the factorization, it depends on the prime. So if p is equal, to, in both cases, this factors as 1 fifth times 2 thirds, or 1 third times 2 fifths. If p is equal to 3, this is going to be 2 thirds times the multiplicative inverse of 5 mod 3. And if p is equal to 5, this is going to be 2 fifths times the multiplicative inverse of 3 mod 5. And so going through, this inverse is 2, this inverse is also 2, and so uh, in this case it's 4 thirds. We kill off, uh, p we can subtract off uh, the integer 1 from this without changing it, so 4 thirds becomes 1 third, and here this is just 4 fifths. <clears throat> and this fractional part, on the other hand, if, p van if this fractional part vanishes when p is a prime other than 3 or 5, because 2 fifteenths will then be a p-adic integer for all those primes. <clears throat> Yeah, so in particular, so to get into details of the naughty thing, I'm going to use e to the 2 pi i k over d is denotes the kth power of a pre-specified primitive d root of unity and in whatever field we're working in. Um, this notation will obey all of the usual rules one expects for complex exponentials. Multiplying them turns into, uh, multiplying two exponentials means you add the exponents. Raising an exponential to a power multiplies the exponent, uh, and the multiplicative inverse of the of the exponential is the same thing as multiplying the exponent by negative one. 
Also, the exponential evaluates to 1 when its exponent is a rational integer multiple of pi. You will also have to take on, you'll have to take on faith that we can do this in a way that makes sense. I will explain it later, but I refuse to do so now. If it helps, I can promise that I will never use logarithms except in their classical real and complex analytic context. Uh, so, with that all said and done, I can finally tell you what we're going to be doing in this episode, and that's covering the basics of PQ-adic analysis. And we're going to be doing it from scratch. We're going to construct the entire subject from the first principles. Actually, we're going to be uh, doing a little bit more than that. Our main tool here is going to be Fourier analysis, and uh, the root is we're going to first establish the Fourier inversion theorem, then I'm going to discuss Banach spaces and measures, and then finally we're going to get to the Fourier Steele-Gs transform. Uh, one of the, uh, the highlight of this episode is going to be the fundamental theorem of PQ ad analysis, which is adic analysis, which I, I alluded to and briefly in the uh, in episode one. And again, I'm going to be including computational examples throughout. Uh, so, uh, blah, 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 blah. So, um, normally, Non-Archimedean analysis is done at a really, really abstract level, often with a strong functional analysis flavor. So this is specifically what, what uh, we would some call soft analysis. Hard analysis is when you do things with epsilons and deltas and specifying all of the limits and details, whereas soft analysis is when you use the language of topology and algebra to conceal all of those details, like talking about how such and such a map is an isomorphism of Banach algebras. Uh, it, would be, it would be an example of a, a soft analysis approach. So um, the probably the best, such, really, really comprehensive book on non-Archimedean analysis is, uh, is ACM von Ruiz's very much out of print book, non-Archimedean functional analysis. It was from 1978. It is completely comprehensive, but it is incredibly easy to lose track of the details due to the highbrow uh, approach taken throughout the book. Uh, case of, in particular, uh, uh, I believe I mentioned this before, uh, in 1940s, AF Mana comes out and says we should be able to construct theories of analysis over uh, ultrametric uh, spaces. And then so the Dutch school of non-Archimedean analysis, they came in, they did all that. And so the approach that uh, this book takes is let's describe everything that can possibly happen in any possible form of analysis, which means it's going to be very abstract because you're going to have to spend a lot of time uh, qu uh, qu qualifying and quantifying what particular setups and uh, uh, conditions you need in order for things to work. So here's an example of how von Ruij begins his discussion of non-Archimedean measures. Let R be a covering ring, ring of a set X. Then R is a base for a zero-dimensional topology on X, which we shall call the R topology. If instead of continuous relative to the R topology, we uh, say R continuous, similarly R clopen, R compact, etc. Uh, the sick is here because he forgot to include the closing quotation mark. So, continuing, a covering ring R of X is said to be separating if, for every two distinct elements, X and Y of X, there exists an A in R such that X is in Y and Y, X is in A and Y is not in A. The R topology generated by a covering ring R of X is Hausdorff, if and only if R is separating. Yes, for the record, the entire book is like this. It's horrifically dense. And this makes it an incredibly good reference for specialists doing abstract stuff, but it, it, it they for in terms of welcoming new covers, they might as well have st stuck up uh, heads on pikes. Uh, it's that deterring. Thankfully, for PQAC analysis, we can take a much more concrete approach. Still, there is a bit of abstraction that must be introduced at first, if only to give us the proper terminology. So our main object of study will be functions of the form f from p-adic integers to f, where f is a valued field. In case you haven't heard that term before, here's what it means. So let f be a field. That's, uh, uh, I hope we all know what, the, what a field is. And an absolute value on f is a non-negative real-valued function alpha on f, such the following properties hold. It, uh, alpha is positive definite meaning it's always non-negative, and it's equal to zero if and only if its input is zero. Alpha is a multiplicative homomorphism. 
or just multiplicative for short. It turns multiplication in F into multiplication of, in, of reals. And three, it satisfies the triangle inequality. If in addition to three, uh, alpha satisfies the ultrametric or strong triangle inequality, I, I, uh, which is that alpha of x plus y is less, if it satisfies this, we say alpha is non-Archimedean. The ultrametric inequality is that alpha of x plus y is less than or equal to the maximum of alpha of x and alpha of y, with the caveat that if alpha and x and alpha and y, if and only if alpha and x and alpha, alpha y are different, then this is going to be an equality. So when alpha and x and alpha, and that's an infinite only if. Thus, if alpha and x and alpha of y have, are different, this is equality. And if this is an equality, alpha x and alpha y are different. And if they're the same, then it's an inequality, a strict inequality. Um, if uh, our absolute value only satisfies 3 but not 4, we say it is Archimedean. The trivial absolute value is the absolute value alpha, which is sends 0 to 0 and sends all other elements of our field to 1. Given an absolute value, you will get a metric d. Uh, given absolute value alpha, you'll get a metric d on our field by the formula d of x comma y is alpha of x minus y. The trivial absolute value is the unique absolute value which induces the discrete metric, aka discrete topology on f. A valued field, then, is a field which is equipped with an absolute value, uh, usually denoted uh, 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 f, but I'm going to use q for this, as I'll to get to that in a moment. A non-trivial valued field is when the absolute value is non-trivial. A non-trivial non valued field is Archimedean, respectively non-Archimedean, based on whether or not it's a of the value is Archimedean or non-Archimedean. So that means that an Archimedean or non-Archimedean field cannot have the tri trivial absolute value, just by the definition we're adopting. So if we equip, uh, if F has the trivial, trivial absolute value, note that convergence in this top topology is means that the sequence is eventually constant. I mean, Xn plus 1 equals Xn for all sufficiently large n. If F is non-Archimedean, we define its residue field as the ring theoretic quotient of f modulo the ring of f integers. Here, we define the ring of f integers as the set of all elements of f whose absolute value is at most 1. Yeah. And a value field is said to be spherically complete if uh, every decreasing sequence of closed balls it has a non-empty intersection. Uh, we also have some, uh, the most important thing is knowing what, uh, here is knowing what an absolute value is and knowing whether it's Archimedean or non-Archimedean. Um, and just remembering that the residue field exists as a thing. When we are working over the p-addicts, the residue field is fp, the field, well, finally many elements with p elements. <clears throat> so we also have some, the number theory terminology, a locally, a, a local field is uh, a field which is locally compact uh, and as a topological space, and its topology is non-discrete. You can forget this in a moment because I'm just going to tell you what local fields are, likewise with global fields. So a global field for us is either the rational numbers or an extension of it, a finite degree extension, or it's a field of rational functions over a finite field or a finite extension thereof. Local fields, on the other hand, are, so this is an important concept. When we give a field an absolute value, that makes it into a metric space. But it might not be the case that the metric space we get is complete. The simplest example is the rationals. We can equip that with the ordinary real absolute value. And though this gives us a metric space, it's not complete because the uh, uh, sequence converged the the decimal digits of pi converge to the decimal part of pi, which is irrational, but uh, that is not an element of q because it's irrational. So um, given an absolute value on a field, the completion of the, of the field with respect to the absolute value is the usual construction where we do the Dedekind cuts and Cauchy sequences. Basically, it means any Cauchy sequence in the field is, that is automatically declared to have a limit in the field, and that's the completion. The way we're going to see it is that local fields arise from completing global fields. 
In particular, a Q or a finite degree extension thereof is going to, we're going to call that a number field. Uh, 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 rational functions with, oh, with coefficients in a finite field or uh, an extension of, of such a field of functions, we're going to call those function fields. For us, global fields are function fields or number fields, and local fields are fields that we get from completing global fields with respect to a particular absolute value. As an example, Q is a global field, and the P, for any prime P, the P, P adic rational numbers QP is a local field, which we obtain by completing Q with respect to the P adic absolute value. On the other hand, R, the reals, that's the completion of Q with respect to the real absolute value. That's, R is also a local field, but it is Archimedean, whereas the P addicts are all non-Archimedean. Uh, given a valued field f, I write f bar to denote the algebraic closure of f. This means we take f, then we write any polynomial in uh, with uh, one in uh, one variable with coefficients in f, and then we find all the roots of those polynomials and we throw them into f bar. That f bar is a set of f plus anything that's the root of a polynomial with coefficients in f. I write f double bar to denote the metric completion of the algebraic closure of f. It is an unfortunate fact that, in general, when you take the uh, algebraic closure of, the field, of a field, the resulting space is horribly big, and it's, at the, it's actually a miracle that the algebraic cl uh, uh, cl uh, closure of the reals is the complex numbers. That's just that's, that's the reason why complex analysis is so amazing, well, one of many reasons. And um, in general, the uh, F bar is not going to be complete as a metric space, so we need to complete it again in order to uh, get in, in order to get a metrically complete valued field. Um, if F is a non-Archimedean local, in fact, indeed, if F is a non-Archimedean local field, then it's algebra. Then the algebraic closure, the metric, the uh, also the uh, metric completion of the algebraic closure is then neither locally compact nor spherically complete. So, in other words. Non-Archimedean local fields, their uh, their algebraic closures are infinite uh, infinite dimensional in a in that sense. So now just cover the notations. So p is the prime numbers, the set of primes. This is the p adic integers. This is the p adic rationals. P is the p adic absolute value, which is defined it's the multiplicatively by the formula uh, p p equals one over p in the usual way. Z p cross is the group is the set of, of multiplicatively invertible p adic integers, and uh, this is a group under multiplication. This is the same thing as the set of all p adic integers with unit, p adic absolute value, which is the same thing as the set of all p adic integers which are not congruent to zero mod p. Cp is the uh, field of p adic complex numbers, by which I mean the metric completion of the algebraic closure of Qp. So Cp is Qp double bar. Note, again, that C CP is neither spherically complete nor locally compact, so neither of those facts will be relevant here. VP is the p-adic valuation, so that the p-adic absolute value is p to the negative VP, and VP of 0 is defined to be infinity, or a little definition, little def over equals means by definition. For any integer n greater than or equal to 1, z mod nz is the set of integers from 0 to n minus 1. I will, uh, I then put a cross to denote the subset of this, which is a co-prime to n. Uh, I will treat these uh, things as, the, uh, as uh, rings of integers, modulo n and the group of units thereof, as the need arises. For any real number x, n x means all integers greater than or equal to x. So n0 is the not negative integers, n1 is the positive integers. z p prime denotes the p adic integers with n0 removed. This is the same thing as the set of all p adic integers that have infinitely many non-zero p adic digits. I write p adic variables in lowercase fractor font because I think it looks like the Daedric script from the Elder Scrolls games, which makes me feel like a wizard, and that's cool. So, in the K in terms of integrals, the two main cases we will be seeing are this Fourier integral, the integral of Zp, 
the integral over zp of f of z e to the negative 2 pi i tx, d, uh, this should be a z, tz dz, for a continuous function, f, and uh, the integral of a measure, uh, d mu. As functions, these maps here, are complex exponentials, are going to be taking values in f bar, in f bar bar. As an example, if f is a function from the 2 addicts to the 3 addicts, then the complex exponentials will be taking values in the 3 addict complex numbers. The same is true uh, if, if uh, f, f takes values in k, where k is any extension of q3. Uh, uh, in practice, our computations are going to involve working with uh, uh, functions in q bar, the algebraic closure of q, and then we only do finitely many operations until the very end, like we did in episode one, where we take limits. Uh, now, just a reminder, the almighty Iverson bracket. This is going to be one when the statement inside is true and zero otherwise. This is one if z is congruent to k mod p to the n. So this is the indicator function for the set k plus p to the n z p. A more common notation for this function would be this. I want this notation to die. It is awful. It takes up more space than, it's, than is necessary, and it makes things uglier. So next, uh, we have notations for series. So here, uh, f is this is the absolute value, and we're going to want f to be metrically complete just for the sake of it. So given any function from z p hat to f, I define this sum is it's the sum of f hat of t for all uh, 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 rat, uh, p p area rationals, whatever, uh, uh, with denominator at most p to the n. So by definition, this integral is the sum of f hat uh, uh, at a k over p to the n from k equals 0 to p to the n minus 1. Similarly, I write the this, the sum over tp equals to p to the n. It's the sum over all uh, uh, fr uh, fractions with uh, uh, with whose numerators are co-prime to their to, to, to the denominator, specifically to Pn. And note the identity that we saw this in the first episode, that summing over all Ts with denominators at most P to the N is the same thing as summing over all Ts with denominator exactly P to the N plus the sum of all Ts with denominator at a most P to the N minus 1. Then we also have the vitally important level set of decomposition. This is technically wrong. This should be f hat of 0 plus the sum from n equals 1 to big N over the sets of constant absolute value. I then define this sum. It's the limit of the partial sums here. I will write, and so in particular, I uh, use this notation. I, I, again, I had to explain this. Uh, to someone uh, in the Piatic, an ultrametric analysis journal, because they didn't understand what this meant. This is, and so this is a, a, an artifact of that. When I'm considering the limit as t pro p approaches infinity, this means what happens is the denominator of, of t gets big. In particular, this means uh, that for every epsilon, there is an n greater than or equal to zero, such that the f absolute value of f of hat of t minus b is less than epsilon whenever t has a denominator at least p to the n. So in particular, I will use this, pro for, for, uh, This I'm going to refer to this as at infinity. So if I say f hat decays q adically to zero at infinity, this means the limit as the p adic absolute value of t tends to infinity of the q adic absolute value of f hat of t goes to zero. And I'm going to write uh, the field above the equal sign to denote the topology in which things are going on. Finally, oh, I have bold one zero. This is the indicator function of the number zero, and in particular, it's the identity element of z p hat, which means uh, this is uh, this is equal to uh, uh, one if t is in the unit interval and is, and is precisely zero, and it's zero otherwise. And this makes this function one periodic. Add one doesn't change it, and more generally, any function uh, on z p hat is going to be one periodic because this is what happens with the quotient. Also note that uh, we can denote indicator functions of neighborhoods of zero by writing this. Uh, one zero of p to the n t, this is going to be one if t's denominator is at most p to the n, and it's going to be zero if t's denominator is bigger than p to the n. Now in the tradition of the Dutch school, I will give the loud proclamation of the conventions we will adopt regarding the fields that we'll be using. For all parts of this uh, episoidy, 
Unless stated otherwise, we fix a prime number P and we fix a rational prime Q not equal to P. We allow Q to be the infinite prime, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. We fix a metrically complete locally uh, local field F with absolute value Q. Additionally, if F is non-Archimedean, we require its residue field to have characteristic not equal to P. So, as I said, I don't care much for abstraction. It has uses, but like absolute power or cesium-137, it tends to corrupt those who spend too much time with it without the proper protection. The beauty of abstraction is twofold. Not only does it synthesize different situations and reveal elegant reductions, it also paved the way for something truly invaluable. It tells us how to do things we couldn't do before. And uh, what's actually one of the things I, in terms of pedagogy that I find the most tragic. Um, uh, uh, when you, it, it's far, it's up to me, I would leave it for the reader to figure out the concepts, whereas the thing that I, as the instructor, would want to teach them is the actual steps to do so, like uh, how to use uh, the definition of the exterior product to compute determinants. I want to know the steps to do, the manipulation to do, the valid manipulations for, oh, well, for, it's for, for the formal level, because once I know how to do the computation, I, I can then gain familiarity with the ideas and the significance if I just do it again and again and again and again and again, because eventually I'll notice the patterns and the connections. But if I don't know how to do the thing, then it, it, I won't be able to do it on my own, so you haven't actually taught me anything. For me, a good mathematics lecture should be empowering. It should teach you how to do something that you couldn't do before. In that respect, the de a definition is useless because it doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you what things are. Thus, for example, Bourbaki defines the uh, gamma function as the unique logarithmically connect, uh, uh, convex metamorphic function satisfying the fu gamma function's functional equation. This is useless because it doesn't tell me how to compute it. I can't attack it. I have to already know what the intentions are, what that context and that background is, in order to be able to take it and play with it. And for me, that's just that's just not fun. It's not fair. I want to, when I teach people things, I want them to be able to go off and explore it on their own with what I gave them, rather than have to have them consult someone else to get, to get filled in on all the facts that I didn't care to tell them. So, in the beginning, so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a very nice description of the modern take, mostly modern take, of uh, abstract harmonic analysis. So, in the beginning, there was a group, G. By equipping G with a topological structure, in so that the underlying, that as maps of the underlying topological space, group multiplication and the uh, send elements to their inverses map are continuous. This makes G into what is known as a topological group. If, as a topological space, G is locally compact, we say that G is a locally compact topological group, LCTG. Locally compact means, remember, that for every element of G, there is an open set, open neighborhood of, of U, uh, of U of X, can, it, such, such that some compact subset of G contains U. Locally compact topological groups are stupidly important, particularly in the case where G is abelian, in which we say G is a locally compact abelian group, LCAG. Abstract harmonic analysis, and in particular the theory of Pontryagin duality, tells us that given an LCAG, we can set up a form of the Fourier transform. Fourier analysis of periodic functions on a closed interval or on O of R, or on whatever, are subsumed into this abstract theory, uh, as, are, uh, uh, as is a for an analysis of functions on the torus or functions on the p-adx. In all of these cases, the functions are real or complex-valued. Abstract harmonic analysis also covers uh, LCTGs, though that becomes much more complicated. Fortunately, the case where G is compact rather than locally compact is significantly more manageable. Uh, so there are two key players in LCAGs, one of which is also a key player in LCTGs. Uh, the key player unique to LCAGs is the so-called group character, or to borrow some terminology from Tao's Fourier analysis notes, which are great, the, uh, the group frequency. 
Uh, when G plus, that is written additively, is an abelian topological group, a character is a continuous group homomorphism from G to the circle group, which we view here as the set of uh, complex numbers with, in the, uh, with absolute value 1, so it's e to the 2 pi i t for some rational number t. Every character is then of the form chi of g equals e to the 2 pi i uh, c of g for some unique, or is it xi? For some unique frequency c, uh, this be, when a frequency here is a continuous group homomorphism from g to r mod z, where we here we're going to identify, we're going to always identify r mod z as the oh, as the uh, half open unit interval equipped with addition modulo one. The set of all frequencies forms an abelian group under pointwise addition, and the set of all characters forms an abelian group under pointwise multiplication. Uh, in this case, the inverse operation is just negative, and here it's the reciprocal. The map that sends t to e to the 2 pi i t is then the obvious uh, group isomorphism between these uh, the, the group of frequencies and the group of characters. And so the, both of these uh, groups are realizations of what is called the Pontryagin dual of g, which is denoted g hat. The Fourier transform is a linear operator, which turns suitably nice complex-valued functions on G into uh, suitably nice complex-valued functions on G hat. The inverse Fourier transform turns suitably nice complex-valued functions on G hat into suitably nice complex-valued functions on G. The other key player, and this is the one that works in both the abelian and non-abelian cases, is the glorious Haar measure. This is a translation invariant measure, meaning that if we have a set u in G, which is measurable with respect to our measure, then given any G in G, and here G is abelian, the translative u by G, G plus u, which is this, is also measurable, and the set of the, the measure of the translate is the same as the measure of the original thing. A great deal in harmonic analysis, you make a great deal of a fuss about the fact that Haar measures always exist uh, in both the abelian and non abelian cases. There's even, I believe it's Springer, they have in their graduate series of mathematics, they have a wonderful book called The Joy of Haar Measures. Mm. They're fun. And so it turns out that Haar measures are unique up to some constant. That is to say, uh, Haar measures on G is a one dimensional vector space. If G is compact, you, and if it contains a particularly important compact set, compact subset C, we can specify a unique harm measure mu by picking mu so that it is the, a probability measure on C, uh, so that mu of C equals 1. If G itself is compact, we then pick mu to be the, har, the probability measure on G. The, the power of algebra and abstraction lies in the fact that with this, uh, we can use one construction, just a single one, and it works in all these cases, and then we can define uh, LP spaces with respect to these measures and do analysis and make sure John Tate can still write his thesis, and it's all great. <laughs> we can also, so as another example of empowerment, we can also use algebra to figure out how to generalize the concept of characters to the non-abelian case. This has to be done seeing as the Pontryagin duality theory of locally compact abelian groups no longer works in the non-abelian case. Uh, characters, it, it doesn't make sense there. And uh, algebra, again, tells us how to generalize. And we do this by working through things, doing, shutting up and compute and noticing patterns. So the generalization comes from the observation that technically a character of a group is a representation of a group, well, of that group. So recall a representation of a group G over a vector space V is a homomorphism, which is continuous if G is a topological space, that to every G in our group gives us an invertible linear map rho G on V. The homomorphism condition means that if you have the, a product G times H in G, here we're writing G multiplicatively because we're assuming it's not necessarily abelian, rho is going to send uh, G times H into rho, of, rho G applied to rho H, and this does, in particular, uh, this homomorphism is going to send multiplication in G to the uh, multi multiplication in the group of invertible linear maps on V. Also note that if V is the topology, these linear maps need to be continuous. So while a character chi might not be a linear map, 
Note that because chi of g is some complex number here with absolute value 1, we can use it to create a linear map by left multiplication. So in, in other words, given an element g of our group, we can then associate it to the uh, map on the complex numbers, which multiplies everything by the number chi g. This is a one-dimensional representation because the vector space we've chosen, c, has dimension 1. When working with locally compact uh, topological groups, uh, then instead of Fourier transform sending functions from uh, 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 functions on G to functions on the group of characters, it's going to send functions on G to functions on the uh, uh, the, represent, uh, group, the representations of G, where the representation is a set of representations of G over V. So that's the modern theory, and obviously it's very pretty. Now suppose I ask you to compute this integral. You see how there's a disconnect? I, while this is all very nice, I want to know how to compute this integral because so far, like in this here, look, you haven't told me how to compute a hard measure. You haven't told me how to determine what a character is. You haven't told me if any group even has a non-trivial character or not. You haven't told me any of these things. A lot of people say, well, the whole fun of math is to discover it for yourself. No, that is not fun. That's torture. What's fun for me is being able to take what I've already learned and then play around with it, it's like sandbox, experiment. Str and seriously, I enjoy stringing, cis, uh, uh, stringing together uh, sequences of symbols just to see what happens. Because in doing so, you never know. You might discover something new. <laughs> so, um, so the modern mathematics mathematic would say that you need to have maturity to figure out the details on your own. But in my view, that's just an excuse that we, and by we, I mean they tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about the fact that most of us don't actually care enough to devote our time to explain the details like this. It's much easier for a talk to just give this nice, pretty abstract summary and then leave you to figure out the integral on your own, or worse, pass it off to the TA. So um, we have research grants to chase, and besides, if we have to suffer through figuring out the details on our own, so should the next generation. And it's worth noting that that same logic is what justifies generational child abuse. The parents were abused by their children, so they figure it wouldn't be fair to them to spare their children from similar abuse, and so the cycle of pain perpetuates. It falls to us to be the change we want to be, see in the world. For more on this, particularly the familial dysfunction bit, read part two of my novel novel, The Worms of Andalon. So anyhow, the problem with the nice, clean bird's eye view is that, like all abstraction, it focuses on the greatest common denominators. But there are also least common multiples, and they are just as important as, and indeed dual to, the greatest common denominator. By forcing ourselves to adopt an abstract point of view, we indulge in a form of intellectual triage, which dismisses out of hand any detail which is not absolutely essential. To the task at hand. Uh, this is why I don't, one reason why I don't like the tensor product. There, there is no such, in my opinion, there is no such thing as the tensor product. There are many different tensor products. There's one for algebra, there's one for fields, there's one for vector spaces, and the reason why is because this single idea has so many different uh, rules and variations and manifestations that, at least in far as what symbols we write down on the page, like, uh, it, they might as well be completely different. Uh, you can't, in my in mind, the, there should be different symbols for the different products so that we know, for example, if the tensor product of two vectors is going to be a matrix or is it going to be a vector, if it's, et cetera. And yes, I'm distinguishing matrices and, ve and vectors because a matrix is a, is a two-dimensional array of numbers, whereas a vector is a one-dimensional array of numbers. So, um, uh, yes. So, uh, this is, the, well, it's perfectly fine to use the abstract approach if we've already figured out what we're going to investigate. In that case, figuring out what counts as absolutely essential becomes highly non-trivial, and it's worthy of pursuit to figure it out on its own. But if we're just looking around, the abstract point of view can be very restrictive. Yes, from space, you can see that the Earth of, is round, and that is very important, but uh, Gobe Gobekli Tepe is also important, and the only way to see that is to hike up a hill in rural Anatolia. So in this video, I'm going to do something where I'm pretty sure has never been attempted before, and I'm going to be covering not just PQ-adic analysis, I'm going to be covering all possible forms of analysis for functions of a p-adic integer variable, and we're going to be doing all of those forms of analysis simultaneously using this, a, a single set of symbols.
and it's super easy and super lovely, and I have no idea why no one's ever thought of doing this before. So, like so many of the best mathematical findings, the fact that we can do this is both astonishing and yet also bizarrely trivial. Much like with the tensor product, where as uh, uh, Kay Conrad would like to say, the only thing you can do is consider a bilinear map, the analysis that we will be doing will force itself to work out nicely, simply because that's just how the algebra works out. And if we begin this, and also we begin this with an act of courage, one that most modern, modern mathematicians simply don't have the balls to do. I am going to pick a basis, just one, only one basis. No other basis will exist. Everything will be done with respect to this basis. There will be no change of basis, let alone nasty things like covariance or contravariance. We are going to do everything with respect to one basis. We will be small-minded and parochial, and it will be glorious. Today, we are all Philistines. So I will now pause uh, to give the viewer an opportunity to put on their physicist hat. Is it on yet? Okay, good. So stereotypically, one of the chief differences between how mathematicians do mathematics and how physicists do mathematics is that a physicist is far more comfortable with improvising beyond the bounds of what their theory can justify. Thus, for example, renormalization of quantum mechanics. The mathematics of it is completely goofy because it's integrals over a non-locally compact space, but they do it anyway, and it works, and so we just get on with our lives and wait for some enterprising PhD student to figure out what's actually going on. Yeah. So, um, although uh, this, there is almost certainly a way of laying everything out as a pre-existing theory, theories, as a rule, don't pre-exist anything. They come about from making observations, and so that's what we're going to do. In an earlier episode, I once said that the Iverson bracket is my favorite notation ever. Well, here's part of the reason why, because I literally owe my doctoral degree to the Iverson bracket. We're going to milk that damn thing for all it is worth, and to that end, it's actually going to be very instructive if you think of this whole episode as trying to get as much mileage as possible out of the Iverson bracket and a couple of elementary identities. Also, though I'm no good at algebra, I'm pretty sure that the next like hour or so of what I'm about to tell you can be summarized by li loudly yelling, tensor to extend scalars, tensor to extend scalars. But that really doesn't carry the same weight, so we'll do it the long way. <clears throat> so again, it's not an exaggeration that the entirety of Fourier analysis of functions of a p-adic integer variable emerges from our indicator function for the set of z congruent to k mod p to the n. Uh, uh, so, in this way, we can think of this function as something that accepts an input in the p-addicts and produces an output in the set 0 and 1. Um, now, can you think of anything else which contains 0 and 1? Dora the Explorer music plays in the background. But yes, the answer is a field. By definition, a field is a set containing 0 and 1 and possibly other things too that satisfies the axioms that we know and love. As a result, given any field f, any field at all, we can view our Iverson bracket as a function from zp to f. We can then get other f-valued functions by multiplying the bracket by elements of f, i.e. by scalars. And then we can add two such brackets to one another. Even better, we can replace f with an extension of f, or a completion of f. And everything works, because the 0 and 1 in f are also the 0 and 1 in our extension or completion k. Indeed, letting f be any field, if we pick an integer l, some non-negative integers n1 through nl, and k1 through kl, where kl is between 0 and p to the nl minus 1, for all little l, then for any constants, this function here, it's, uh, it's going to be, it goes from zp to f. So what this is, it's the linear combination of L dist big L distinct uh, indicator functions. And so this function is going to be equal to a1 if z is congruent to k1 mod p to the n, and it's going to be equal to a2, etc. And so uh, this works, this construction works for any uh, any field f as all along it's it's a value field of course so uh, these functions are called the locally constant functions and they're the workhorses of analysis on non-archimedean spaces so now we have our definition
let f be a field, and let p be a prime, and let a n be a non-negative integer. I say a function is locally constant, modulo p to the n, if f of z is equal to f of z mod p to the n. That is, the value of f depends only on the value of z mod p to the n. I, more generally, a locally constant function is one which is locally constant mod p to the n for some n. I write s of z p f to denote the set of all locally constant functions from z p to f. This is a vector space over f and under the operations of scalar multiplication and pointwise addition. It also becomes an algebra over f if we equip it with pointwise function multiplication. Now, um, observe that every locally constant function, mod uh, p to the n, can be uniquely written as a linear combination of finitely many indicator functions. f of z is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to p to the n minus 1 of the value that f takes at n if z is congruent to n mod p to the n. Actually, no, here it's, n, no, m is correct. Here, n is any integer greater than or equal to n. Consequently, for any two locally constant functions, f and g, if we pick large enough n, we can multiply them like so. And then the rightmost equality here, uh, this should be equality, not inequality, falls from the fact that indicator functions are orthogonal. As long as they're, they're the same, uh, the modulus is the same, then these are going to be equal to this if m is equal to n and 0 otherwise. Uh, in particular, from the ring theoretic perspective, this means that S of ZPF contains non-trivial items, meaning elements which are neither 0 nor 1, whose square is equal to themselves. Uh, so the example, this function is an idempotent because if you multiply it by itself, it's going to be 1 if z is congruent to n mod p to the big N and 0 otherwise. And when you have an, item, an idempotent, 1 minus the idempotent is also the idempotent. The set S Z P of C, where uh, when we have our field is the complex numbers, goes by another much more famous name, and this is the set of schwartz bruhat functions on Z P. These are famous from Tate's thesis, and that's why I use the S. When doing the analysis of functions on complex valued functions on a locally compact abelian group, the schwartz bruhat functions on G are then the, core, the analog of the familiar Schwartz functions used uh, for harmonic analysis on Euclidean space. And when G is locally compact rather than compact, the Fourier transform will send schwartz bruhat functions to schwartz bruhat functions, exactly as how it sends a Schwartz functions to Schwartz functions. Uh, it was just a fun exercise. Since we will use be using uh, these locally constant functions to generate our, the functions we're studying, it's instructive to know that there is a purely ring theoretic reason why we cannot define the derivative of one of these locally constant functions. So algebraically, the most important property a derivative has is that it is a derivation. Uh, specifically, given an algebra A over some field F and a derivation on A is a map D from A to A satisfying the following rules. The first says that it is a linear map with respect to F, and the second is the Leibniz rule, or the product rule. The fact that PQ attic and P infinity attic analysis, this means uh, the analysis from P func functions from the P attic to the Q attic where P and Q are distinct, and the functions from the P attic to the reals or complexes, the fact that these have no derivatives in them, in the classical sense, is due to the fact that for any field f, the only derivation on a S of ZPF is the zero derivation, which sends everything to zero, and, can prove, and the proof is as follows. By induction, using the uh, product rule, you can show that for any derivation on a commutative f algebra, d of f to the n is n times f to the n minus 1 times d of f. This is the generalization of the chain rule applied to exponentiation of, of a function. So letting B, D be a derivation, note that by D's linearity and the fact that this set is linearly independent, in order to determine what D does, it suffices we know what D does to our basis. So letting F be this function, note that since F to the N is equal to F for all N, and since multiplication in this uh, in our locally constant function space is commutative, we have the following. 
D of F to the N, well, this is the same thing as D of F, since uh, F is idempotent. This is going to be N, F to the N minus 1, times D of F. This, since again, F is idempotent. This is N, F of Z, times D, F of Z. And so we get that 1 minus N, F, times the, uh, the, the derivation of F, must be identically 0. So... <clears throat> Uh, the, since both since both this and this are locally constant, we should be able to write uh, this. This is going to be a locally constant function. So there's some m that we can write it like this, and so uh, we get, then get this, and then taking care of the, ignoring the n, which are multiples of p in case f has positive characteristic. It then follows that uh, for every n and every m, either f of m is one over n, or f's uh, derivation is zero. And since we've assumed that D is not the zero operator, there must be an, an F and an M so that D F of M is non-zero, which forces F of M to equal 1 over N for all N, which is impossible because uh, F is a function, so F can, of M can only be one number. So D has to be the zero operator, and therefore calculus in the traditional sense is impossible. So far, we have not invoked any topologies or metrics on V. Let's remedy that. Here, we're going to let F be any topological field, meaning it's a field where the field operations, I mean, it's a field which is topological space, and the field operations are continuous there. Let F be a locally constant function from ZP to F. Then F is continuous. So since uh, by linear combinations, all we need to do is show that the indicator functions are continuous, and then, and then everything's fine. And to do this, we're going to use the topological definition of continuity. So let f be this indicator function, and let u be an open space, open set in our field. Since f of, takes only the values 0 and 1, there are four possibilities for the preimage uh, of, of u under f. If u contains neither 0 nor 1, then f's preimage of u is empty, which is open. If u contains 0 but not 1, then the preimage of f is this set, which is open in zp. If uh, u contains 1 but not 0, then uh, 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 preimage of u under f is going to be uh, everything in z except the uh, set where uh, ex yeah, except, uh, except the set where it's a, I don't know, I think it's the other way around. It's the other way around. And this is going to be a union of open sets, and therefore it's an open set. And if both u, 0 and 1 are contained in u, then f inverse of u is zp, and it's open in zp. So f inverse of u is open in zp for all open sets u, and therefore uh, f is continuous. So again, note here the, uh, that, it, ironically, we're doing with the absolute minimum that we need, because and all that matters here is the algebra, literally the symbols that we write on the page. So where to next? In the classical theory of Lebesgue integration, a real-valued function of a real variable is integrable if it can be approximated by linear combinations of indicator functions of the form x is in e, where e is a measurable set. These are called simple functions. This is a simple function, and linear combinations of it are called step functions. This is very nice, because then it means whenever you're doing Lebesgue integration theory, if you want to prove something, you just prove that it uh, holds for indicator functions of measurable sets, and then pass the limit. And this, this is the exact philosophy we're going to do here. And so this is fun, well, the fun part is that for any metrically complete, uh, any metrically complete valued field f, not only is this set of all possible indicator functions dense in the space of continuous functions from ZP to f, but as we're about to see, this particular choice of indicator functions is a basis for the space of continuous f-valued functions of a p-adic integer variable. Here, lambda p is the floor of the base p logarithm of n plus 1, which is the, this is the number of digits in the p-adic representation of n. This basis was first discovered by Marius van der Put, a member of the Dutch school, and is known as the van der Put basis in his honor. With it, we can produce van der Put series for continuous functions by computing their van der Put coefficients. So let f be any field. Technically, f can be any abelian group, but we don't need to do that. So for any function f from zp to, uh, to our field, and for any non-negative integer, the nth van der Put coefficient of f is defined as follows. It's f of 0 if n is 0. And if n is not 0, it's f of n minus f of n minus. 
n minus to get what what that's defined as is we take n, we first write it in uh, has a Hensel series. This is in base p, and then to get from n to n minus, we kill the rightmost digit. Note that this Hensel series representation is going to be unique because dl here has to be non-zero. So we delete the rightmost non-zero digit, and that gives us n minus. I then define s of f, also written by a sp, and I, for f, and I use this notation in my dissertation. I'm going to denote this as the formal sum where we sum, multiply the nth VDP coefficient by the nth VDP basis function. I call this the Vanderput series of f. And uh, if f is, and here this at first, it's just a purely formal sum, much like the f series that we started with in episode one. If f is a valued field, I will then define the domain of convergence of s of f as a set of all p adic integers z, such that this series converges in, in the value to, in the topology of f. Uh, here, uh, it should be a metrically complete value field. More generally, I call expressions of this form Vanderput series. Um, so we're going to begin our work with Vanderput series by noticing the following, that n0, is all, the non-negative integers, are always in the domain of convergence of the Vanderput series. So the Vanderput series agrees with the function it represents at the non-negative integers. We're going to do this in a couple of steps. And first, however, we need to make a very, very important observation. Let k be a positive integer. Then the positive integers with exactly k p adic digits are those in the range p to the k minus 1, p to the k minus 1. Using this, we perform what I call a lambda decomposition. This is where we take a sum over n0 and then decompose it into a sum over the subsets of n0 on which a lambda p is constant. So uh, letting uh, uh, so here's the uh, proposition. Let f be a metrically complete valued field and uh, uh, let f be a function from zp to f. Then for all non-negative integers big N, we have what I call the Vanderput identity. This says that if we take the Vanderput series of f, and sum from n equals 0 to p to the n minus 1, that's the same thing as precomposing f with the projection mod p to the n operator. In my dissertation, I call this the nth truncated Vanderput identity. So fixing z, we start by applying a lambda decomposition. We sub pull out c0, and then we sum over the level sets where lambda p of n is constant. Now, letting k greater than 1 be arbitrary, since n is being summed over all numbers with uh, k p digits, note we can stick this Iverson bracket in here. Because Now, here's the thing we have to observe. There's going to be at most one value of n in this range, which is congruent to z mod p to the k. And that value is precisely z uh, mod p to the k bracket. This is thus, like we saw in episode 1, this Iverson bracket is going to kill all n in our sum except n equals z mod p to the k. So I can delete all of those n and instead replace n with z mod p to the k. And this, again, we're just shutting up and compute, computing. We're doing the things and seeing what happens. Note, so z is the pi integer, and this is the number in between 0 and p to the k minus 1 we get when we project z mod p to the k. So z is always going to be congruent to this integer, mod p to the k. So because of that, this uh, bracket always evaluates to 1. So that gets us this. Now we have to examine this part. So the Iverson bracket here on the right tells us that for this to be non-vanishing, we need for z mod p to the k to have k p adic digits exactly. So if we write z in Hensel series form, we then, by definition, this is what z to the p, z p k is. Now notice, for an arbitrary z, there's no guarantee that the d k minus 1 will be non-zero. The fact, what this Iverson bracket stipulates then, is the condition that d k minus 1 is non-zero. Knowing that with that condition true, we can then compute z p k is minus. And so we're going to subtract off its rightmost digit, which in this case is this, and that gets us j, k, j equals 0 to k minus 2. This, by definition, is z p k minus 1. Note that this is true e whether or not 
regardless of whether or not dj dk minus one is non-zero. And so in doing this, we then have that by definition, this is the ZPK uh, VDP coefficient. It's f of ZPK minus f of ZPK minus. This is f of ZPK minus f of ZPK minus 1. So, and ignore this k, it's a leftover from the old version. And so replacing this symbol with this symbol, we then get this. Claim. This Iverson bracket can be removed. Proof of claim. If z mod pk has k p digits, then this is one, and the Irison bracket disappears on its own without causing us any problems. So suppose lambda p of z p k is not k. That this occurs only when d k minus one is zero. So d k minus one is zero, but then this sum is the same thing as this sum because the final term is zero. So in that case zpk equals zpk minus 1. And so in that case, these two are the, are the same, so this becomes 0. So if uh, this is true, this occurs, then this is evaluates to 1. And if this occurs, then this evaluates to 0. So in any case, the Iverson bracket will vanish. And what this tells us is that the Iverson bracket isn't needed at all. And so this thing just simplifies to f of zpk minus f of zpk minus 1. And then this proves the claim because we get a telescoping series. Now, uh, now uh, okay, uh, ignore the, where it says Vanderput identity here. Right? This, just ignore this. Pretend this isn't there. So now we have our big theorem, and this is very important. Let f be a metrically complete valued field with its absolute value like go to q, and let uh, f be a function from zp to f, and let d be the domain of convergence of f. Actually, no, this is the lemma. The theorem comes up next. Then, uh, uh, I, sorry, in my, in my, uh, so then what we have is that for any z in the domain of convergence of the Vanderput series, the Vanderput series is equal to this limit. Again, this is the rising limit, as we because we saw that from rising continuity. In particular, we have that the non-negative integers are all elements of D, and that this limit converges in the discrete topology if Z is a non-negative integer. In my dissertation, this is a leftover from when this was in my dissertation. In my dissertation, I called this the Vanderput identity, and called uh, this the nth truncated Vanderput identity. Instead, I'm just going to call this the Vanderput identity and call this just it's a fact. So this result is actually an, a part of exercise 62b on page 192 of Shikoff's book, Ultrametric Calculus. So we'll use the Vanderput identity. Uh, we get this. And so now let z be an n0 then zpn is going to equal z whenever n is bigger than the number of p-adic digits in z. And so n bigger than lambda p of z implies that uh, this is going to be equal to f of z, because it implies this is equal to that, and that equals that, because their inputs are the same. So when n is big, this thing becomes equal to f of z, and so the partial sums s of f of z converge to f in the discrete topology when uh, z is zero. For all uh, z and zp prime, meanwhile, the partial sums of s f of z by the Vanderput identity converge to a limit if and only if uh, this rising limit it converges. In which case, well, we get what we want. So this now we get our big theorem, which is that the VDP series represents all continuous functions from zp to f where f is any metrically complete valued field. This means f can be Archimedean, this means f can be non-Archimedean, and the res this even means f can have the trivial absolute value. Regardless, it still works. So, theorem. Let f be a metrically complete valued field with the absolute value q. Then 1. Every continuous function from zp to f admits a unique representation as a Vanderput series. Boom. And that this series converges uniformly with respect to z. Additionally, if f is non-Archimedean, then uh, our function is continuous if and only if its uh, Vanderput coefficients tend to zero in absolute value. So, proof one. So first, uh, uh, we have to show that this representation is unique and everything. So first, observe that given a VDP series, if it converges uniformly, 
then since the series partial sums are locally constant, their partial sums are continuous. And as my old uh, professor at, at an undergraduate, uh, John Garnett, would say, the most important theorem in analysis is that the uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous function. And so, as everyone knows, this then guarantees the, that this uh, series will uh, converge uh, to a continuous function if it converges uniformly. Um, in particular, what this shows that every uniformly convergent VVP series is continuous. So to finish, we just need to show that every continuous function can be represented as a uniformly convergent VVP series. So letting f be continuous, since z mod p to the n converges to z p, converges to z p adically, by the continuity of f, we have this. That is, every continuous function is rising continuous. By the Vanderput identity, we then have the, this is true, and so the limit of so the sum of the Vanderput series is equal to the rising limit uh, by the Vanderput identity, and the rising limit is equal to f by the uh, definition by f's continuity. So S f represents f everywhere. Here, the convergence of the series is necessarily uniform because f because z p is compact, and uh, f's continuity on z p makes uh, uh, this. Uh, it makes it uniformly continuous, and so this limit is uniform. Boom. Then two is just the standard uh, basic facts of ultrametric analysis, where series converge if and only if their terms go to zero. <clears throat> so this is great, because it shows that we really can just shut up and compute. We don't need to worry about fancy theoretical questions or morphisms or whatever. We just take our functions, write them as VDP series, uh, do everything, interchange summation with whatever operation we want to do because it's uniformly convergent. We don't need to worry about interchanges and we can then turn off our brains and enter the nirvana of mindless computation where we can see what wonders await us. So to that end, we're going to need the formula, which we saw from episode one, which is quite literally the most important one in my whole research. And this is that the indicator function for z uh, uh, is congruent to k mod p to the n, this is just 1 over p to the n times the sum of this thing. And we proved that in episode 1. And so this here's where things get fun. We can view this formula as the Fourier transform of this function. And this formula and this result, uh, it holds no matter what field we pick. As long as, 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 long as our, our, our field, of course, it has to contain a primitive p to the nth root of unity in order for this to make sense. And also we need the characteristic of f to be not equal to p so that we can divide by 1 over p to the n. <clears throat> yeah. So this is, and we're going to milk this, and we're going to milk it so much. So classically, one usually defines the Fourier transform after you've established your Haar measures and built up your theory of integration. Well, this, well, we can do this here. We're not going to do that. And instead, we're going to define Fourier transforms, the Fourier series, in an inverse way. In particular, I have the following inverse definition. Let P be a prime number, and let F be a metrically complete valued field whose residue field, if it has one, is, is char has characteristic not equal to P. I then say that F has a Fourier transform if there is a function f hat from zp hat to the algebraic closure of f, such that the Fourier series generated by f hat converges uniformly in f to fz. Astute readers might notice that our inverse definition is actually the Wiener algebra in disguise. Blah, blah, blah. I'll explain this more of this later on. So anyhow, if this was classical analysis, our inverse definition of the Fourier transform would be incredibly restrictive. The great subtlety of classical analysis is that the existence of the Fourier coefficients of a function is by no means sufficient to guarantee that the Fourier series will converge. The poster child for this subtlety is Kolmogorov's famous result, his first mathematical, first scientific result, proved at the age of 19, where he constructed an F that's integrable, but whose a Fourier series diverged almost everywhere, and later he improved this to everywhere. Um, there is also the case where you can have a continuous function, and actually I can write it out for you. The continuous function, we were just looking this up uh, last night, uh, n equals zero, uh, n equals one to infinity of sine of uh, two to the n cubed pl uh, plus uh, one pi x uh, over two times 
and the second. This thing, it's, this is uniformly convergent by the Weierstrass M test, and so this is going to be a continuous function. It's very, very, very uh, wiggly. And this thing has a Fourier se series which diverges. This, in particular, it's uh, the L1, the little l1 norm of its Fourier uh, coefficients is divergent. So that goes to show you that continuous functions need not be represented by uniformly convergent Fourier series. Yeah, so um, de this definition, as it will see, turns out to be the Goldilocks definition. Not too little, not too much, just right. So um, uh, for, the forget, for to get started, let's just begin with computing some Fourier transforms. Viewing our indicator function as a, a function from zp to f, then the Fourier transform of zp hat, a function of, of, our, of the indicator function, is the following. It is 0 if t has a denominator bigger than p to the n, and otherwise it's e to the negative 2 pi i kt over p to the n. And the proof, we sum the Fourier series and just, and just use our proposition. Boom. So, since the van der Put series of a continuous function converges uniformly, we can compute the Fourier transform of such a function by just using our uh, Fourier transform of the indicator function and then doing it term by term, and the uniform continuity does it all. And so again, because we're shutting up in computing, I'm first going to give you the formula, and then I'm going to prove that it works. So let zp to f be continuous. Then the function from zp hat to the metric completion of the algebraic, uh, sorry, this function from zp hat to, uh, to the algebraic closure, this is going to, we're going to def define this and I, I suppose I should, this should be f double bar. Yeah, this should be f double bar. Anyhow, this is the formula. So for if t is 0, we sum from n equals 0 to of this thing. And if t is non-zero, we sum from n equals uh, denominator of t divided by p to the infinity of this thing. And the convergence here is in f double bar. And this is convergence here is uniform with respect to t. Again, we don't need to worry about any fancy theories or Galois theory or whatever. We're just going to shut up and compute. So to begin, we're going to write our van der Put series. This is its Fourier transform identity. We then sum over the level sets. Boom, boom here. And then in doing this thing, note that again, this is our fact. It, N will have k p digits if and only if it's in this range. So we can re-index. And so we then get this thing. And then doing it all, we get what we want. All interchanges of sums are allowed because f is continuous and therefore the convergence is uniform. So it's all nice and it's wonderful and the uh, rearrangement of our sums in this step is valid. Next, note that when t has an absolute value of p to the k, k is equal to negative v p of t. And so this sum, well, we're going to take k and make it negative v p of t. And then we can rewrite this. It's just t p over p. And so k equals 1, uh, and then we so what we're left with in this case is it's the sum from k equals 1 to t over p of, and that, of course, is going to be everything but 0. And so we have this, we get this, this is the sum over all the non-zero elements, and this is recognizing this as the t equals 0 case of the sum on the right. We get the following. And since we started again, since we started with a uniformly convergent series, we finished with a uniformly convergent series, and the result is uniformly convergent, and this then guarantees uniqueness and everything we want, and this is the formula. And the convergence is f double bar, although technically we only need to work in the metric completion of the, of the uh, uh, direct limit of the uh, join all the roots of unity field, but uh, there's no problem here. And the thing to note is that since the... Uh, but, and the characteristic of fp is not equal to p, then p is the qx absolute value of 1, and so things. And again, it's the uniform con continuity by the interchange. It's very nice. So the moral here is that the existence of the van der Put basis, basis allows us to reduce Fourier analysis of continuous non-Archimedean value functions to mere linear algebra. We don't need to worry about covering rings or zero-dimensional topological spaces or measurable cardinal numbers and all the stuff that the Dutch art, non the Dutch school did. In, uh, we just need to write things with our basis and then compute. In particular, the Fourier inversion theorem follows by direct computation. So let f be continuous and suppose f is non-Archimedean. Then, with using our formula, we have that 
the Fourier series for f hat. The Fourier series generated by f hat converges in f double bar to f, and the convergence is uniform in z. Additionally, given any uh, g hat such that uh, which decays to zero in this way, the Fourier series converges in f double bar uniformly in z, and then g hat is the Fourier transform of g. Finally, if g equals f, then g hat equals f hat, and so this is that the Fourier series is unique. And I call this uh, the Fourier series of f, obviously. The proof, uh, we use our delightful formula here, and we just do the dual computation of what we just did and undo it. Just sum it all, and then we, when we sum it all, we then get, and because we're a non archimedean we have the q addict decay justifies the, the convergence, and then everything works. And then uniqueness follows from the uniqueness of the Vanderbilt series. So now, before we go on a little bit more, I need to give you a word of, about say something about mindless computation. So I, while mindless computations are much maligned in mathematics, both by experts and laity, and while most of that is rightfully deserved, that, that derision, there is at least one aspect of mind, mindless computation which is not only fascinating, but it's powerful and beautiful. Mindless computation is how we figure out where to go next. Not all of us are geniuses. In respect, it's, uh, it's foolproof, and the proof is the law of large numbers. It's the infinite monkey theorem. If we keep typing random sequences of symbols for a sufficiently long time, we will eventually discover something interesting. This is especially useful for a problem like Colatz, where we simply don't know where to go. This is experimental mathematics at its finest. We try something, and we see what happens. Is this the best, wisest, and most perfect of all approaches to mathematics? Of course not. But it is an approach. And to dismiss it out of hand by insisting on the overly uh, the use of overly complex simplifications like schemes or differential forms or atomic homology in all contexts is foolish, because it means we're wasting mankind's single most value, single most abundant resource. Stupid people like myself who have some curiosity and a bit of time on our hands. If we can't conduct our explorations at the stupid level, how can we hope to progress at the advanced level? Uh, to uh, that end, let's play around with what we developed to see if anything interesting happens. Let me begin with an observation. Although we explored the van der Put series in the context of a continuous function, Note that our formula for the van der Put coefficients only requires that we know the values of f on the non-negative integers. So there's, we can use that formula for any function, not just continuous functions. So why not try chi q? In fact, since chi q, as we saw, is not too q adequately continuous, its Fourier series, sorry, it's a van der Put series, will not converge uniformly to chi q. But we can compute the series anyway, so why not try it? What's the worst that could happen? So given any integer k, the largest possible integer k with, two, with k two adic digits is 2 to the k minus 1. And so every integer with k two adic digits is a tensile series of this form, where again, note that the last digit, dk minus 1, must be equal to 1. So we can replace k with lambda 2 of n, because that's the number of digits in n. We then get that n is equal to lambda 2 of n minus 1, is the sum from l equals 0 to lambda 2 of n minus 1, of dl 2 to the l. The rightmost digit here is d lambda 2 of n minus 1. So by this, and because we're specifically in the two addicts, we know that, this, that the leading term must be 1. So n minus is going to be n minus d lambda 2 n minus 1, 2 to the lambda 2 of n minus 1. So it's just this. So chi q of, what this then tells us is that chi q of n will have to be the same thing as chi q of n minus plus 2 to the t lambda 2 of n minus 1. Now we're going to use the concatenation identity from episode 3. That is to say, if we have some sequence of zeros and ones, uh, I1 plus I2 times 2 plus I3 times uh, 2 squared plus dot 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 plus IM times 2 to the M minus 1 plus 2 to the K, uh, 2 to the M times some integer K. This is the uh, composition sequence dictated by bold I applied to chi Q of K. So let N be greater than or equal to 1. Now let bold I uh, represent N minus. Then since lambda 2 of N minus is at most lambda 2 of N minus 1, 
the length of i can be any number m, which is greater than or equal to lambda 2 of n minus. So what I'm going to then do is I'm going to pick the, the string that represents n minus. I'm going to have a string of length lambda 2 of n minus, and then concatenating m minus lambda 2 of n minus's minus the number of zeros so that we get an i of length m that we can then use this formula. In other words, what I'm saying is that uh, if n minus doesn't have enough digits, we'll just add in the rest. And so with this setup, we have that i, the digital sum of the digits of i, the, the dig sum 2, is equal to n minus. So now let's use uh, our this equation right here. With k equals 1 and m equals lambda 2 of n minus 1. So what this says is that n, chi q of n is equal to chi q of n minus plus 2 to the lambda 2 minus 1. This is the part that corresponds to n minus. And this is our, uh, uh, here's k is 1 and m is this. Well, by this formula, we're going to, there's going to be the string i represents h n minus, and it represents n minus. So this becomes, by the concatenation identity, uh, h bold i of chi q of 1 because 1 is the coefficient of 2 to the m. But uh, then we can, this h bold i is an affine linear map of the form mqi times our very input plus chi q of i. And so we get this. Uh, yeah. So the uh, important thing here is that be, uh, even though i might have extra zeros to the right, we saw that chi q's value at a string is independent of, x, is unchanged when we add or subtract zeros to the right. So this is chi q of uh, bold i is chi q of n minus. On the other hand, mq will not have this property. And in particular, the value of mq of bold i will depend on our choice of i. As constructed, i has length m, which is lambda 2 of n, of n minus 1. And since i represents n minus, uh, uh, it's going to have its num the number of 1s in bold i is the number of 1s in n minus. But we got n minus from n by killing off the rightmost digit, which was a 1. So n minus has exactly one one less than, uh, one fewer one digit uh, than n does. And so mq of i, it's number of q to the number of 1s in i over 2 to the length of i, which is going to be q to the number of 1s in n minus 1, because we applied this minus subscript, uh, over the length, uh, 2 to the length of 2 of n minus 1. This is 2 over q times that, and this is 2 over q times mq of n. And so we end up getting chi q of n is equal to this, and since chi q of 1 is equal to 1 half, we have here. Chi q of n is equal to 1 over q plus, times mq of n plus chi q of n minus. And so because of this, we then have that the nth van der Put coefficient is this difference, which is precisely 1 over q times mq of n. On the other hand, when, c, when c, n is 0, Chi q, uh, chi q, the zeroth coefficient is just the chi q of zero, which is zero. And so we get that s, has, s of chi q, the van der Put series generated by chi q, it's this thing. As I do, um, and this is also when I, our, we just did this. So we saw, now here's the fun part. We showed just now that since this is a van der Put series, this thing is going to converge to chi q if z is a non-negative integer. That means this thing is, and so this is where the, le the uh, functional equation lemma we, came, we proved in episode 3. This is where it comes back to get us. S chi, chi q of z by the van der Put identity, this uh, S chi q of z is going to be rising continuous, and it's going to e agree with chi q on the non-negative integers. But then by the lemma that we proved, this forces S of chi q to represent chi q everywhere. And so it turns out that uh, th uh, this identity is going to hold for all p adic integers z, two adic integers z, but the convergence is pointwise instead of uniform. So what this then tells us is that rising continuous functions, you can then think of them as the uh, van der Put series, which converge pointwise rather than uniformly. Uh, so uh, this gets, so we can get a van der Put series representation. That's really cool, and this is useful. So the fact that we can do this, again, it's something completely new, and it's only happened because we bothered to compute this formula. If we hadn't wasted our time, if we hadn't, quote-unquote, wasted our time with this computation, we wouldn't have discovered this. So now, as, there's actually even more here. Consider the function 1, negative 1, 
which is the indicator function for the set, the singleton, negative 1, the two addicts. This function is going to be 1 if z is negative 1 and 0 otherwise. Because the support of this function does not contain the non-negative integers, all of its VDP coefficients are 0. And so the VDP series of this function is the constant function 0. And since, uh, S of, of, since uh, this function is not its own uh, Vanderput series, we conclude that uh, this function is not continuous, not rising continuous. Uh, in my dissertation, I showed that S is actually a projection from the uh, a set space of all f-valued functions on Zp to the space of rising continuous f-valued functions on Zp. And so a function is rising continuous if and only if it is uh, uh, unchanged, if and only if and only if it is fixed by uh, by S. And so e at every continuous function is fixed by S because every continuous function is rising continuous. But the actual fullness of, of S's behavior only comes when you consider just rising continuous functions.